registered. Um, welcome back to many of you. I know that there are a lot of people registered who've been following us um, over the series of the this web, over the webinar series thus far. Um, if you're just joining us for the first time, thanks for joining in. My name is Haley Ross, and I work for the Columbia Mountains Institute, or CMI for short. And I'm joined here with Kendall Benish with the Kootenai Conservation Program, or KCP for short. And we've joined forces again um, in what is the eighth season of CMI's CRUD Talks for the Columbia Region Ecological Discussions and KCP's 10th Winter Webinar Series. Now, before we get started, um, I would like to just pause and acknowledge that the region in which both of our organizations work is in the unceded homeland of the Sinaiaks, the Shequapam, the Tanaha, and the Silk Okanagan peoples, who have stewarded and cared for this land, water, and all living things since time immemorial. Now, as we've been doing in the webinars thus far, this is a really great opportunity for all of you to introduce yourself via the chat and also share which Indigenous territories are zooming in from today. And as you do that, I'm going to run through a bit more material. So this season's webinars will explore the theme of wildlife corridors and ecological connectivity. We're welcoming eight speakers who will discuss the theme from different perspectives, providing a wide view that can help inform conservation of connected and resilient landscapes in the Columbia Basin. This year's series is financially supported by the Columbia Basin Trust and also LGL Limited. Thanks very much to these organizations for ensuring that we can continue to offer this series free of charge. And thanks to all of you for tuning into the fourth, uh, the fourth talk of this series today, where fire mitigation specialist Larry Price will present his work with the First Nations Emergency Services Society and how they work with First Nations to develop an integrated spatial database and other planning tools to support collaborative planning. Larry will, will discuss how integrated fire management planning provides a framework to develop and implement management strategies that will maintain and enhance ecological integrity and function of regional connectivity corridors through time and space. So I can see that folks are introducing themselves. Thanks very much. As you continue to do that, I'm just gonna take a moment to introduce CMI. So CMI is a nonprofit society and an association working for people who, who are working in various fields of ecology. We provide professional development opportunities in the form of conferences, courses, webinars, of course. Um, our courses teach skill-based research techniques and our larger events take on kind of more complex land management conundrums. Our website, of course, is the best place to learn more about CMI and it contains great resources, such as these recordings, but also proceedings documents and recordings from all of our major talks. You can find that at cmiae.org. Now I'm gonna hand it over to Kendall. Thank you, Haley. My name is Kendall Benish, and I'm joining you on behalf of Kootenai Conservation Program, or KCP. KCP is a diverse network of more than 85 land and water conservation stewardship groups, federal, provincial, and local governments, First Nations, land trusts, agricultural producers, and educational institutions who all contribute to conserving our region. The purpose of KCP's partnership is to cooperatively conserve and steward landscapes that sustain biodiversity and naturally functioning ecosystems, and to generate the support and resources that are needed to advance this effort, which includes building technical knowledge in webinars like this. We're very excited to be hosting this webinar series again with Haley and with CMI. And we'd like to give an additional thanks to all of our program sponsors without whom we really wouldn't be able to support this type of work. Just a couple housekeeping details from me and then we'll get rolling. So this webinar is being recorded and it'll be posted within a week to both CMI's event webpage and to KCP's winter webinar webpage and you're welcome to share it accordingly. You can also utilize, oh, we'll have a Q&A at the end of the presentation. And please use the Q&A function in your Zoom toolbar. So you'll see the Q&A button there to add a question to the queue and we'll do our best to make our way through them. You can utilize the upvote button in the Q&A. So if you see a question in there that's similar to yours or that you'd also like answered, you can press the thumbs up icon beside that question and it'll move it to the top of the queue. 
And that's it, back to you, Haley. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so now the moment you've all been waiting for, I'd like to introduce Larry Price. I'm just going to read a short bio and then I'll hand it over to him. So Larry is a registered professional forester, as well as a forest technologist with 50 years experience working throughout BC. Current responsibilities include working with First Nations to identify community needs and support access to funding for implementing measures that reduced wildfire risk and increased community resilience. Over his career, Larry has worked with the provincial government at the district, regional, and headquarters level, and for the past 12 years with the First Nations Emergency Services Society. So Larry, thanks so much for taking the time to prepare this talk for us today. I'll let you take it on, take it over. Okay, thank you. I'll see if I can just start my video and share and Perfect. hopefully it all works out here. <clears throat> Okay, can everybody see that? <laughs> okay, good. Well, I'm very pleased to uh, be here and uh, uh, to represent Finesse and provide an overview of integrated fire management planning and, and how it might uh, mitigate the risk to the ecological integrity and function of connectivity corridors, as well as touch on some other uh, um, issues in terms of wildfire mitigation around the built environment. So I just want to also thank um, Caleb Rebel, C Caleb Rempel of Finesse and Dane Cox, GIS analyst, for helping put to put together this uh, Arc View sto Arc Map Story uh, presentation. Uh, it's come a long way from the overhead projectors and mylar screens with the colored pens that I I did earlier in my my career. So thanks. Just wanted to acknowledge those folks. I just wanted to say. Uh, just want to acknowledge the ancestral homeland and unceded territory of all First Nations in BC. Finesse is, uh, you know, working uh, across the entire province and you can see the uh, traditional territories map, you know, throughout the province as we kind of zoom in here that goes across the border um, into Alberta as well as uh, the Yukon. So a very large area of Finesse has uh, supports 205 um, bands throughout the province. That's our mandate to support them. Um, Finesse currently has um, 86 um, full-time and casual staff um, currently and currently e expanding. Uh, I know when I started with Finesse in 2012, there were six of us. Uh, and so a big shout out to Wayne Schnitzer, our executive director, soon to be retired, who's done a masterful job in terms of building uh, finesse, getting it to where it is today. <clears throat> so finesse's mandate is to assist First Nations to develop safer and healthier communities by providing the programs under the four pillars of emergency management planning, you know, consistent and based on the Sundai framework as adopted by the BC government. Um, today, we're gonna talk about the Overview of Integrated Fire Management Planning Framework or process. We're gonna explain the linkages uh, to a project initiative of reducing risk of severe wildfire in the Southeast uh, corner of British Columbia. This area um, you know, is covering um, about nine, or sorry, 2.8 million hectares uh, in this part of the province, as well as another mapping product that's gonna support um, uh, future wildfire resiliency, you know, covering about 10.2 million hectares to South Central BC. And I hope to, as we talk about integrated spatial database, it's really the real engine behind this, making sure we have access to all, you know, spatial information to support our business needs and how this information really links and supports the four pillars of emergency management planning, mitigation, preparedness, recovery, and, and response. And linked to this, you know, to propose a governance structure framework, one that currently exists, one that needs to be created to help us mitigate risk to ecosystems and the built environment, as well as ensuring that we have feedback and adjustments. Finesse does work for First Nations. First Nations are our are, are clients and we work on their behalf. And we wanna make sure that all the work we're doing is in line and has full support of First Nations communities. 
And, and lastly, to really identify the linkage and synergies to support related in initiatives such as landscape level planning, old growth strategy, BC First Nations workforce strategy, you know, and just, you know, linking to biodiversity um, management, uh, uh, you know, as we move forward. So start off with a problem statement. Um, and current wildfire mitigation programs fo are focused on project-based planning. You know, you, you apply for grants from, you know, federal, provincial, regional kind of programs. And, you know, to do various projects uh, that take into account at the project level when you develop your prescriptions, they do look at all the resource values, but, but these do not look at the holistic landscape in terms of planning and designing these treatments from multi-programs, taking into account multi-resource planning through space and time. And that, and we need to do that. And we need to make sure that they they you know consider you know over the long haul, like not you know just the first five, ten years, but we look out two hundred years, seven generations, as we hear a lot from First Nations about that planning, and that's what we're uh, attempting to do by implementing the uh, IFM framework. So, key piece of IFM framework components is the assembly of an integrated spatial database and the ability to have the tools to access, share, and distribute that, that information. And then also being able to use spatial and temporal models to forecast potential impacts to the values in the built and natural environment. When I talk about built environment, I'm really talking about residential infrastructure, um, critical infrastructure, highways, roads, transmission lines, those type of things. And again, we'll talk about the establishment of regional and local governance bodies to confirm, to identify and confirm strategies and actions and making sure that we have effectiveness monitoring processes in place to make sure that we can support adaptive management. We're continuously improving on our management strategies as we learn and implement you know, activities on the land base. And then lastly, identify prioritize projects at scale beyond just the you know project by project level but looking across the land base at projects that link and are harmonized so we'll talk a little bit about the uh, integrated spatial database what you're looking at here is just uh, an area around um uh cranbrook um you can see the saint mary's uh, um First Nation, or sorry, the reserve in the middle, Akam. Uh, and then, so we're just going to zoom in here a little bit. And uh, what you're seeing here in the in the darker, or sorry, the shaded areas is the wildland urban interface um, zones that many of you likely are familiar with. So we, these are areas that are have been identified on the, the proximity, uh, you know, uh, structure density and the proximity to that. You, you know, if we see the fine line here, um, that's based on six uh, structures per square kilometer prox proximity. And then we've got the uh, larger wooey area here that goes out to two kilometers. And a lot of these um, wooey areas are kind of linked to applying for a, a various, you know, funding sources, like to get grants, you know, if, if structures, if they meet minimum structure densities and they're in the wooey. So as we, another area that we look at is the existing fuel treatments that have happened around the land base. So right in the middle of the screen here, we're looking at the uh, Cranbrook Regional Airport and, uh, and a strategic wildfire prevention initiative treatment that took, took place, uh, let's see, intake year 2016. And this was strategic wildfire prevention initiative project number six. 79. So as part of the, the um, integrated spatial database, we're assembling all the treatments that have uh, occurred over the years, you know, from 2004 uh, to present time, so that we have an idea of where the treatments uh, take place. So we're working uh, diligently to um, get that together with a, a, a large number of uh, organizations, municipalities, we'll be working with the BC uh, Wildfire Service, Ministry of Forest to, to get this completed. 
One thing that's really striking is when we look at integrated information on the land base, um, we start to look at um, you know, where, where did fires occur on the land base? And one of the key pieces of information, we can look at historical fires on the land base. And so if you look at these, I believe the records here are probably from uh, um, 1919. And you can see that a large part of the area, we see Kimberly, Cranbrook, is covered with, with, with areas that have had wildfires on them. So um, if we look and zoom in here on the the area that has the green line around it. This was from 2023, the, the wildfire that uh, you know occurred on Ackham Community, the St. Mary's wildfire, and uh, you know burned uh, 4,640 hectares. So um, very useful information to have. So if we kind of look over here, what's this fire occurred in 1960, and it was lightning caused, and it was again, over 4,000 hectares. So um, very useful information as you start to look at, you know, where the existing wildland urban interfaces are, where the fires have historically spread across the, the, the land base. As we kind of zoom in here a little bit more, I talked about, this is a very busy slide here. So um, it, it, it shows the wooey areas, but the, the point is, is we wanted to kind of look at some of the built environment and why it's important to kind of map and locate it and how geospatial information really helps us in this regard. So I'm gonna zoom in here a little bit. Um, this area here is on Occam Reserve. We're gonna zoom in here and look at some structures. So uh, one thing Finesse has uh, been working at is we realize in many First Nations communities, we might not have structure densities that, you know, that you know have the mapping for we around them like they, they might be less than st six structures per square kilometers so as part of our database assembly we are identifying every single structure on every reserve in british columbia and actually you know buffering them with the fire smart zones so that that we can use this information and support first nations on all four pillars of emergency management planning so if we talk about this, we can see these individual structures here that my cursor is going over. Um, it, you know, we can look at this in terms of preparedness. Like, it, so have we had a home ignition zone assessment? Like what is the ignition susceptibility of the structure taking place on it? Um, have we developed or what is the potential for doing structure protection planning here? Is there a need for doing fire smart neighborhood assessments? And we have the ability through our, our uh, technology, we have a, a system called Lightship that allows us to go out and actually collect this information in the field, do our home assessments in terms of ignition susceptibility. And this is all entered into an integrated spatial database. Has this house had a smoke alarm installed in it? What's happened with education and awareness in this community? All part of the integrated spatial database. And then we start to look at with respect to the fire smart zones that are actually generated for every one of the structures, um, well, we have the measures been implemented to reduce structure, uh, reduce structure ignition susceptibility. Um, as there an opportunity to have these folks applied for the fire smart rebate program, all of this in the the database, and then we get to the issue of kind of response. So. Um, we have, you know, we're assembling all the information around where have all the previous fuel treatments done in and around the communities to support suppression activities. Um, you know, so so we've got also rapid fire smart assessments and actions. So one of the things that we have done previously is we'll deploy teams out if a fire is in or around the community, it's it's been affected by an evacuation order or alert. We'll deploy teams out to actually do rapid fire smart assessments in and around the structure. And if need be, deploy our, our teams that work uh, within Finesse to do rapid fire smart mitigation. And, um, you know, so basically going in there and throwing everything that's, if, you know, flammable or could be an ignition source for 10 meters around the structure. Um, and then work with the incident command teams with the Ministry of Forest 
and the sprinkler protection uh, unit folks and implement kind of treatments here like sprinkler protection uh, systems on the structure to save it. And, and this is, was deployed um, in 2021 around the White Lake uh, fire in, uh, you know, with the Okanagan Indian Band. And actually it was responsible for saving many, many um, structures. Another important uh, piece of information around the four pillars uh, is recovery planning. So being able to go in here, if a wildfire has occurred and damaged the structure, um, we, we do rapid damage assessments, you know, loading this information right into the spatial database. This structure has been damaged. You can't occupy it or it's been totally been destroyed. It also then allows us to link this geospatial information and work with the bands and the other organizations supporting recovery to say, well, who lived there? Did they have uh, pets? Um, have Do we know how they applied for evacuee status? Are, are they eligible for disaster financial assistance? If not, are they then maybe we can get in with donation funds to help and support them. So for all, you know, all of the four pillars, having this geo-referenced information is extremely, extremely valuable. Just wanted to make that point. Uh, another piece of key information that we have in the database is um, administrative boundaries. Now, we all know that admit fire and wildfire behavior doesn't necessarily, it's not affected by administrative boundaries. Wildfires go across administrative boundaries. But this is a real key piece of information that we need to have in the, in the system as we plan and develop, kind of identify priority treatment areas is that many of our funding sources, federal, provincial, and regional funding sources, you know, the eligible activities are linked to some of, you know, is it on reserve land? Is it on provincial crown land? Is it on municipal land? So in order for us to kind of apply for the appropriate funding um, that we can leverage across various programs, we need to know where all the administrative boundaries are. So a very key piece of information. Uh, another one, we're just giving you a taste of some of the data in the da in the database. So then we look at all the issues surrounding, we've all heard about old growth. So we've got, you know, legally defined old growth areas. We've got um, technical advisory panel um, areas of, of old growth. We've got non-legal areas of old growth, all of which we, we need to kind of consider in our, our planning. And so again, as part of the, the integrated database, um, we can actually kind of look at um, around the land base, you know, you know, what is this old growth area that's been identified? You know, how big is it? Um, is it it's a non-legal one that this one just sit, seems to um, sit in uh, provincial parks, Kootenai Provincial Parks, a provincial park, that old growth. So just an example of, of needing to know where all these various values uh, exist throughout the land base. And then, of course, we've got consumptive use watersheds, domestic watersheds that, you know, that are used for irrigation, you know, consumptive use watersheds that are used for our water supplies. Very key um, piece of information that we need to know and, and plan and design for. These are some of the watersheds um, that are established and designated around the, the Cranbrook area. And then, of course, we've got all the other things like, you know, rare and endangered species, ungulate winter range that we need to consider in our planning. Um, we can just take a poke at this one right here and see what comes up. And uh, let's see. Long-billed curlew. Um, so just, you know, it's a, it's a flag to, to, to tell us that, um, these species exist and that they need to be considered with respect to our, our planning, which this one comes up here is, um, I think to do with badgers here. There's a lot of uh, issues with um, badgers in uh, in the East Kootenays and other, other areas. So again, just an example like the with the database that we've assembled that we can kind of link in and turn on um, any of these data layers and, and, and look at the type of um, values and issues that need to be incorporated and considered as we develop um, plans, wildfire mitigation plans for these areas. And again, I just touched on a very small 
part of it. Um, you know, there's you know the cultural and heritage building potential sites, train hazard information. That's all part of the data that we're assembling. Again, critical uh, infrastructure ignition assessments, emergency management plans, evacuation routes. Um, we have um, are building into the database. We've got the uh, connectivity corridors that you heard that uh, Dr. Michael Proctor talked about uh, in, in the first session. So all that information is being loaded into our integrated spatial database. And then what's really important to then consider is like, as we layer all this information on top of one another, where are there opportunities, you know, for us, you know, to implement treatments, to, you know, to get uh, a common uh, ob objective, right? Where are our desired future conditions similar? And we know that from the work we've done, you know, particularly in the, the drier ecosystems, natural disturbance type force that when, we do uh, fire maintain ecosystem restoration treatment or, or a fuel treatment. They look very similar in terms of the desired outcome. So there's opportunity for us to apply and utilize various programs to do treatments at scale and get, you know, and, 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 and get more bang for our buck. And I'll talk a little bit more about this as we move forward with some specific examples that you're likely um, all aware of. Uh, some of the um, spatial products that uh, you know I talked a little bit about um, early on that that's uh, going to help us with respect to our tactical, strategic, and operational planning is a uh, is a uh, an initiative that's happening that's being led by Bob Gray um, that many of you have heard that's that's working with a a, a really a uh, good core team, Dr. Matthew Barbado, uh, Lori Daniels, we've got Jen uh, Barron, PhD candidate. Uh, you know, they're also working with Paul Hesberg um, to um, do modeling, fire modeling on uh, an area that's about uh, 2.8 million hectares that covers um, PFL 14, it, 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 uh, as well as the um, Invermere TSA and Cranbrook TSA, 2.8 million hectares. Um, so this, some of the inputs for the fire modeling, um, they're using LIDAR data um, to derive, you know, the, the, the fuel type information. Canfor is a, is, a, is a partner in this project and they've supplied a lot of the LIDAR data, you know, for inputs on, on weather, terrain, ignitions. They're using a model called FLAMAP. Um, that that you know uh, that's a fire modeling tool that's been deployed and used in the states. Uh, I, I believe the the group in the slow can is also using uh, LAMAP to do uh, modeling. So one of the you know the outputs what we're going to get is you know fire size. Like what are the likely areas that we're going to have severe fires occur given different climate change scenarios um, thresholds in terms of climate change of one point five you know, to two degrees above pre-industrial pre levels and, and show us where fires are likely to occur from the modeling exercise. And then from there, we're gonna work with uh, technical uh, teams as well as uh, other folks. This, this information will all be shared out to identify priority treatment areas. Where should we focus our efforts in terms of priority treatments across the land base? Another another major project that we're working on to support integrated fire management planning is to create a map of uh, resilient forest conditions in the in the BC interior, mainly focused on the the you know the drier ecosystem NDT four NDT three and and with a lens on climate change, how are these likely to shift? So an area that we might have today that's classified as kind of open forest might be moving to open range. And so it might not be in our best interest to plant trees there, um, or if an area that's that's best in the state of, 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 of open forest, and right now the existing condition is that it's got a lot of ingrowth and trees around it, this could be a priority area for us to have a, an ecosystem restoration treatment or fuel treatment to kind of to, 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 to get rid of, rid of that ingrowth and leave the larger uh, trees, you know, the, the ponderosa pine, 
uh, larch that that existed in, in the past and 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 plan and design for more resilient landscapes in, in the future. Um, this is just a, a map that I thought I would put up that's really interesting when we talk about the wildland urban interface. And likely this is just a screenshot that we took from the provincial strategic threat analysis information, which was a, a you know a, a great initiative to you know when when the whole uh, Swipey program started after the 2003 wildfire review, you know to identify areas around communities that we should be looking at and focusing at for doing fuel treatments. But one thing I wanted to say when you look at these bubbles here, they're really just based on you know some some fuel typing and structure density, and so we see these concentric you know circles around you know structure density. And although you know they've been uh, useful, it's a first approximation of where we might want to focus our efforts in and around communities. They really uh, don't really reflect where wildfire might move across the landscape because they don't consider you know topography or weather. And so you know one of the things we're doing at uh, Finesse right now, we've been working over the past uh, year developing uh, variable uh, WUI. Uh, buffer zones that that have the influence of of topography, and so we're just uh, over the next year we're going to be doing some field checks on this to kind of refine it. So as we um, look at the next slide here, um, we're going to just kind of zoom in a little bit on the the, the the you know the wooey areas, and this is Lytton right here. Lytton, and you can see the various uh, reserves that we have in and around the Lytton area. And as we kind of move up um, the Trans-Canada Highway here to a community called Nickaman, where we spent, you know, work with the community for the better part of 10 years and actually designed and implemented um, treatment units uh, around the community. There's, you know, really it's a small community with about 60 structures that was actually affected by um, wildfire and we're going to just go into that right now and show you a little animation so you could notice that the little bubbles you know the wooey bubbles around the communities based on structure density so what is shown on your screen here right now is um, we took um, satellite imagery this was from the modus satellite at this time i it's it's a heat it's a satellite that measures heat signatures as it goes around the earth so we had our decision support uh, department, big shout out to them, who they took this heat signature information and just overlaid it on this map. So you can see over the course, better course of a month, the Lytton fire, uh, Lytton kind of burned to the ground at the very end of, of June. And so this, this represents about a month time period as you can see how the fire moved across the land base over top of, of Nickaman in the center of your screen, and then spilled over it into the Nicola Valley, into you know the Shack and Reserve, and other um, you know other uh, municipalities that you know, exist in the in the Nicola Valley. So you can see that how fire moves across a land base, it really has no you know it, no effect on the wui. The wui does not represent how these fires move in and across. I mean wui areas right now only are kind of been designed on structure density and the proximity to that. Um, this is just a shot. I talked about the Nickman area. Um, the fuel treatments around the community, there was there was not a structure lost. Um, they were very effective in, in supporting fire suppression activities that happened on the ground. There was some back burning that happened within the fuel treatments. A lot of the, most of the trees around the communities are still standing in green. I was in with a team um, uh, about a week after the, the fire had gone through and we had a, 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 a downpour for you know a, an, an hour or so. And you can see how all the soils were hydrophobic. This was a, in an area where we had you know rank five and rank six severe wildfire. And you can see how just from this uh, small rainstorm, how everything pooled and didn't go into the ground. And this was a shot that we took in, in, in August 2021. Um, you know, the, you know, the water pooled, it kind of ran down into the community, took out, you know, a mudslide into the playground, cut off a lot of the roads into the community, ran down, took out the, the, the CPR rail tracks, 
and then took out as well as the Trans Canada Highway. Um, just from this debris, uh, debris torrents. Um, and then um, when I mentioned a little bit about the uh, the wildfire spilling into the Nicola Valley, while these shots are, are from the Nicola Valley, uh, we were in there working with the communities on a humanitarian effort to deal with you know, some of the after effects of the atmospheric river that happened in November 15th of 2021. Um, and so while we were just shortly before we arrived, there was about a 30 minute downpour uh, rainstorm. And this resulted in like, you know, having these major debris torrents come down off the hillside that had been affected by that Litton Creek wildfire in 2021. You saw from that last animation how it spilled over into the valley. And uh, just walking around the site, everything was hydrophobic and, and everything just kind of channeled into these small gullies, came down, took out Highway 8 and spilled into the valley below onto the shack and reserve, burying it in, you know, 10 feet of mud in places. So just just uh, an example of how communities and, and, you know, values can be impacted from areas outside the Wui. There was salmon that were beginning to come into the Nicola River at the time here, and it was just totally loaded up with silt. And again, uh, back to, I've got one more slide to show, to show here with respect to the uh, area around Akam. Um, uh, by Cranbrook. So it's been in the news a lot, the Ackham burn and, 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 and how successful it was. So if you look at my cursor here, this, this, this area here, um, this is the, 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 the airport, uh, the Rocky Mountain International Airport. And this area here was the area that was treated about 1200 hectares um, that had fuel treatment and a prescribed burn that happened um, uh, last spring. And then um, you can see there was a wildfire that started it in, in July. And it started right about here uh, on Ackham Reserve. And, and you can see the effects of the, 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 the treatments that had occurred here, followed by uh, prescribed burn. Um, that's been, again, mentioned in the, the news a lot. And you can see how the wildfire didn't affect this area, right? It kind of ran, um, you know, it, I got to be over, I think, 4,000 hectares. And uh, um, and again, it, it, just a testament to doing the fuel treatments in the spring at the right time, that it was very um, instrumental in, in saving the airport, as well as a lot of other uh, houses that were located um, on, on the side of the, the airport. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about how uh, how does this stuff all fit together? And you know, I know this talk is about biodiversity and connectivity. And so, how how do we go about, you know, helping kind of implement measures and treatments to address biodiversity, you know, the natural uh, environment, um, as well as the, the the built environment. And so, the, this next slide here is going to just talk about the the how things are connected and the type of governance bodies that need to be established or built on uh, to, to help us with this. So this cylinder just kind of represents about, you know, building this integrated spatial database to support a particular business need. And so we talked about, you know, watersheds and old growth and connectivity corridors, ungulate winter range, high value commercial timber, the list goes on. So, in building this integrated database, we are feeding Bob Gray and his teams information around um, the values in both the natural and the built environment. Where are all the structures? Where are the community watersheds? Um, you know, where are you know where are all the streams? Um, those types of values, rare and endangered species. So that information is being um, passed on to to Bob and his team. So that they could model the outputs and and you know and where severe wildfire is likely to occur uh, in those treatments. And Bob is also connected in with a group, uh, Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions. They've got a lot of uh, horsepower, you know, linked into academia. There's a policy advisory team that you know that Bob is working with on that front. 
And then we take this information um, and then we funnel it into our spatial tools and products. And so what we're talking about here is to be able to take all this information and you know, whether it's a desired future result condition map or potential, you know, where the fire was saying is going to occur and impact the values. And we package that information up and we provide it, you know, through viewing tools like ArcGIS or uh, Finesse has a tool called Lightship, which we use to display, share data, collect information, uh, desired future resilient condition maps. Uh, Ministry of Forest is, is moving towards a new system called Forest Management System that we just recently had meetings on this week to make sure that we have interoperability um, with in those systems to display and share information. And then this information is then kind of fed in. We talked about, the, we'll start to talk a little about the governance bodies that are neat. These are absolutely critical. Without these, it doesn't work. So to feed this information, the best information that we have into the first uh, governance structure here I'm uh, looking at here is the regional and local fire smart committees. So looking at where fire is likely to run in and affect communities. Um, so that we can work with the communities and confirm project prioritization, project, uh, you know, funding authorizations, how we might monitor the projects, how to support these regional and local fire smart committees with consolidated information that the, will allow them to collaborate and leverage their resources on projects. And right now, um, you know, fire smart committees are funded through Sierra. The, Community Resiliency Investment Program in BC. And that's great. And they're there. And you know, we're not exactly sure of how many committees are actually functioning in the province right now. But one problem um, that, that exists is that although these groups could come together, which is great for relationship building and you know, explaining what projects they might be working on, they don't have access to collaborative integrated spatial information that shows them where have the treatments been done in the past, where are treatments being proposed through the individual community welfare protection plans or resiliency plans, where are the force enhancing society projects being planned on, on the land base, or a project that might be funded through Columbia Basin Trust. So we want to gather all this information together and we can then plan and use the horsepower and the great people that sit on these committees um, to um, to work and, and, and actually collaboratively plan. And, and we do have some committees that are working diligently on this. The, um, the Crescent Valley um, Fire Smart uh, Committee, the Regional District of Central Kootenai uh, working um, on, on this to kind of plan and bring all the data together so that it can be shared out with, you know, our partners, Administrative Forest, BC Wildfire Service, the Community Forest um, and, and others uh, as we move forward. And then another piece of governance that, that's really needed around the management for the natural environment. This does not exist right now. And, and we will be working with uh, provincial agency representatives and others to uh, see about the establishment of, of these committees. And that's the committees to deal with the natural environment and really to bring all this consolidated data and information together again to confirm priorities on projects and the strategies and the funding and the authorizations and the implementation and the monitoring of the projects. And then, you know, also to be able to work and say, well, we've got X amount of funding. I mean, we've only got so much, maybe we better kind of focus it in this area around the communities and, you know, as well as the natural environment. So these communities have, these committees, like the, the, the regional and local fire smart committees need to collaborate and plan with the regional kind of governance committees that are looking after the natural environment. So this information then having this provides us with a, uh, a, a great great information to feed in workforce strategies because they're going to be like tens of millions, maybe you know possibly a hundred million dollars worth of projects identified here, um, you know from these initiatives that can then feed in and support a workforce strategy. We know that working with First Nations, one of the major issues is that 
working on these uh, project by project funding that we, we might have funding, you know, to do a, a Indigenous Service Canada project or community residency investment project that keeps them working for, um, you know, four months over the winter doing wildfire mitigation and they might do wildfire fighting in the summer, but that's it. So if we have plans and projects put together that we identify here's 10, 20 years of projects, we can work with a training initiative. We can work with the First Nations to give these folks career opportunities, which has all kinds of benefits socially, you know, in terms of moving forward, having this. So this is really a critical piece. Also, this information will be important in, in feeding an old growth strategy, right? Because we've got where fires are likely to occur. Here's the values. Here's our best bet for managing for old growth. It might mean our best bet for recruiting old growth in certain areas of, 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 the, of the land base. It will support landscape level planning that's occurring in the province as built provide this information to help with that initiative, as well as to also uh, link in with timber supply review or timber supply sensi sensitivity. What does all this mean in terms of future wood supply? And we know that in the past, I, I, you know, I, I used to work with the, the land use uh, plan development some 30 years ago in, in, the, in the Kootenays. And what we found really, really beneficial, and it was the first time that was ever done, was we took all the GIE spatial database and we linked it up to the timber supply model at that time, FS Sim, and we displayed the outputs you know, by decade of where the model was taking the wood from. And we were able to kind of work with industry and others to say, well, you know, is this realistic? Yes or no? You know, is the inventory really there? Yes or no? You know, this wood is here, but can we actually go out there and afford to harvest it because they're going to take X amount of dollars to build the road? So it allowed us to really kind of bring in all kinds of expertise in, in seeing where the models were, 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 were getting the wood from uh, around the landscape. And we've heard uh, uh, loud and clear from First Nations, you know, that they want to see this visual representation. So, you know, to better kind of uh, evaluate, you know, impacts, you know, throughout the land base. So this is just how this stuff all fits together. It's a continuum process. And it's a little busy, but uh, hopefully I, I did a good job of trying to explain that. It, it, kind of complex stuff. So I'll, I'll just talk a little bit more about the strategies and actions um, um, around a workforce of so firefighting, you know, uh, fuel reduction treatments, ecosystem restoration, uh, you know, the list goes on. So, um, and the governance structures, uh, this was just an exa example of the technical working group and wildfire modeling team, finesse is doing project coordination, creation of the database, for the built in the natural environment that we'll be feeding. You know, we are feeding to Bob Gray and his team right now. They're gonna be getting some initial outputs here in, in March. Um, and then as we move to the, the governance structure, which I talked to about in the previous slide, these governance structures need to be supported by technical working groups. People, you know, that, that are knowledgeable with respect to you know connectivity corridors and and the, all the work that's gone around them and where do the animals move like so how does that information get put into um, you know priority treatments you know in terms of uh, prescription development and design through space and time and making sure that we have the right people involved it might mean having a parks uh, representative like for treatments that are uh, planned in close proximity to the to federal or provincial parks. And this information is then fed to this strategic planning group that again needs to be created. And I think these groups are being created to support uh, landscape level planning. I used to sit on some committees in my past work called interagency management committees where uh, you know representatives from multi-agencies could work together, see how we could work together in terms of prioritizing projects. First Nations, major partner at the table in all these uh, technical committees uh, so, and then I talked about the existing committees, you know, with respect to the um, uh, fire smart committees, you know, local and, and, and regional fire smart committees, you know, to making sure that this information gets fed to the committees so that they can plan and design trips, work together jointly. Um, 
you know, in getting uh, projects uh, implemented that again, consider um, everyone's priorities um, and, you know, and are done in a collaborative way to leverage resources, you know, from all of these various funding sources at scale. And again, making sure that we've got treatment effectiveness monitoring place, like what are we doing in terms of our treatment implement? Are they being effective? Are they meeting the desired intent? So we know that, you know, one thing we've talked about with finesse um, is to have a ongoing standardized formal effectiveness monitoring program around the fuel treatment so that, you know, with using our uh, technology that every time a fuel treatment is intersected by a, a wildfire, that, you know, it triggers, you know, going out there on site, you know, you know, after it's safe to do so and looking at and, you know, talking to wildfire suppression uh, folks, was the, was the treatment effective in terms of altering wildfire behavior? Um, if so, great. Or, or did it fail because of other reasons? It was, the design was bad. It was in the wrong location. These types of things, like with respect to the fuel treatment, but also remembering that there's other types of monitoring that needs to be done around fire effects monitoring, where we want to, you know, do burning in the spring, like an Ackham, and, and burn to get certain traditional foods, um, ungulate winter range uh, enhancement, those types of things. So we need to know what we're monitoring for. And again, one of the th one of the things that we're working with uh, at Finesse, we have signed on to a uh, a partnership, um, multi hazard disaster disaster resilient network partnership with the University of British Columbia and UBC Okanagan to kind of tie into their horsepower to work, you know, be able to work with us as we go forward to kind of help us out with our research and monitoring need, tag into that horsepower. Also, some of the work we're doing. Uh, will be very beneficial in terms of the the existing task force mandate uh, for the for, that that we've all heard of uh, the premier's task force to kind of look at like how could we more effectively all work together to kind of mitigate risk to communities uh, and as well likely uh, many of you've heard about this new you know special report or report that came out from the forest practices board around forest and fire. Uh, management BC, BC toward uh, landscape resiliency. And the, the, what I just discussed and outlined in terms of the uh, IFM process is pretty much in line with what was being recommended in this report. So some takeaway messages. Um, we need to plan at the landscape level uh, to mitigate risk to the natural and built in fire uh, environment. A spatial database is needed to support collaborative planning and enabling of sharing and leveraging of resources to Im implement projects at scale. Um, we need to establish technical, regional, and local governance to identify party projects and authorizations to support access to multi-program, federal, provincial, and regional funding. And use academia to support us with, our, with respect to effectiveness monitoring and adaptive management. On, on the land base. Uh, that kind of concludes what I had to say. I probably went on a little bit longer. I think we've got about <laughs> six minutes left for uh, Q&A. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that and uh, uh, turn it back to you, Haley. That was great, Larry. I think that everyone will join me in congratulating you on a great talk and what an engaging presentation that is. Um, Dane in the background, thanks for your support in developing that. It was just beautiful. Um, I just want to mention before we hop into the Q&A, um, because Larry was mentioning Bob many times. So speaking about Bob Gray with the Wildland, uh, who's a wildland fire ecologist, um, we do have a CRED talk and a KCP webinar um, with Bob and his team last year. That'll give you an idea of what their prescribed fire work looks like. Um, it's a really fantastic talk with his team, including Dr. Kerry Phillips with the Pacific Institute for Fire Solutions. So that's on both of our web pages with past, past recordings from these talks, just as a, as a heads up there. Um, so we're gonna jump into the Q&A. We don't have a ton of time left, but we do have time for some questions, of, of course. Um, just a reminder, if you could direct any questions that you have, um, don't put them in the chat, put them in the Q&A. 
and I'll do my best to relay those. If there's a question there that you'd like to hear the answer to, give it a thumbs up um, and I'll ask the questions in order of, of popularity, so to speak. So Larry, the first question, um, uh, okay, there's a new one at the top here now. So it says, does the management include monitoring of the amounts of metals and chemical elements such as cadmium in lakes and ponds and wetlands after fires? Well, I guess I guess it could. I mean, um, if that's an issue that that needs to be addressed, that's something that you know we could again work with the uh, the folks you know at at, at the universities and, and others to actually um, you know if that was a priority, kind of implement some uh, monitoring of that. But but to date, in our involvement, any of the work I've been doing with finance, that has not been that has not been addressed. Okay. Okay, interesting question though. Um, so a question from Eric, he says, I also wonder if BC will follow the US service lead. Oh, this is like perhaps more of a comment than a question, but if BC will follow, follow the US Forest Service's lead of creating burned area emergency response teams, which are comprised of experts in soils, geology, hydrology, engineering, botany, recreation, archeology, span and fisheries, along with GIS support and public information officers. I don't know if you have another comment on that. Uh, no, we haven't been doing it, but obviously, um, you know, there's a lot of lessons to be learned for, you know, what's going on at the South. Like, for example, I do know that they do have a formal mandatory effectiveness monitoring program for their fuel treatment. So anytime a fuel treatment is intersected by a fire, it triggers you know they they've got forms uh, that that have been built to go out there on site to uh, gather the necessary information and then put it in the system to kind of support continuous improvement. So that's something absolutely we could look at. Okay, great, thanks. Um, question here from Brian. He says, are the opportunities to integrate your landscape level planning to inform modified responses to naturally occurring wildfire? Essentially, could this be used as a resource to direct the wildfire service to allow fires to burn where it is safe and there are objectives to manage the WUI or ecosystem enhancement targets? I've seen a few fires locally that would have been ideal uh, UWR, I forget how to say that, enhancement extinguished, or they were extinguished when they could have been allowed to burn and have positive benefits. Yeah, that's a great point, and and I think that some of the products, strategies, and actions, which will be actually ge you know geo referenced, spatially defined, and we work with those strategies and actions in partnership with you know BC Wildfire Service, many of uh, water, air, and land protection, the whole works. That that we could get there, we could have that as as, as a as a part of an output to help guide you know modified response. Absolutely. Okay, thanks, Larry. Um... Okay, we've got a question from Aiden. Is this database available on IMAP BC or have you thought about adding it? It would be nice to have this as a category that you could go to with all these layers. Some of the info is already up there, but it takes some know-how to get it on a map. Yeah, that's a really good point. And that's something we'll need to be talking about um, as as we move forward. Like what's, what's the best way to kind of put the information in terms of a a centralized hub so that it is ac accessible, you know, I, you know, through such systems like IMAP BC. So um, getting the information out and available uh, to view is, is absolutely critical. How we go about that um, needs to be defined, but uh, good question. Okay. All right. We're almost out of time. So I'll just ask one more question. Um, and this one comes with a bunch of kudos, as I'm sure there are lots of other kudos coming up in the chat. I haven't had a, a look just yet, but Eric says this is really great with lots of exclamation marks. Um, building an integrated database with attribute and spatialized data. 20 years ago, the Ministry of Forest was creating an integrated system called, oh, where'd it go? Okay, all called Incosada, uh, but it got canned. I'm interested in your cool app or I'm interested if your cool app will also be pulling data from the ministry's forest tenure administration um, and results. So silviculture activities and forest cover. Oh yeah, it can do like, um, uh, it works, you know, maybe Dane can explain it a bit more, but like one of the, one of the things that Lightship works really good is that it, it works off like an application uh, program interface API. So it can draw information from all this. So I, I know that, you know, like results, 
um, you know, fire perimeter data, any of that stuff like can be fed right into the system, as well as us, you know, collecting data, you know, on site, you know, as part of the integrated spatial data. But yes, it can do that. You can draw all that in. You just have to define like what is the, as long as it's not, you know, subject to uh, OCAP, ownership, control, access, and possession kind of um, requirements like for first, a lot, some of the First Nations data or, you know, you know, with rare and endangered species. But um, yes, that can all be brought in. You just have to define what information you need to support the, the business need, the, the question that needs to be addressed. Okay. Okay, great. And I know I said one more, but I'll just do one more because I think this is probably a quick answer for you. And it was one of the first questions up. So this comes from Casey. Um, can you speak to the differences between the IFM Lightship app and the MOF Fire Management System app being developed? Are they integrated at all? Um, we had a meeting actually just um, with what you know the guy that's, you know the the behind force management uh, system, and you know with our technical group. Dane could probably talk to it if you <laughs> if you want to pipe in there, Dane. But it, it's yeah, totally interoperable with us. It's all based on you know Israel kind of products, so totally inter interoperable. The bigger the bigger challenge, the bigger question is making sure we've got assembly of all this um, you know data like this the the the, the the um, treatment data that goes back right from 2004 onward, like there's been, you know, over a couple hundred million dollars spent on that data, you know, on that, on those field treatments. And we don't have a consolidated database of where all the fuel treatments are. And when you think about it, um, say when the air tankers are going out to, you know, do some uh, response work around a community, they don't even have access to kind of where all these fuel treatments have, have taken a place on the land base and many, you know, with one of the objectives, making sure that retardant can penetrate the canopy and they've been strategically placed. So that is our biggest challenge right now is getting all this fuel treatment data as well as others into the system so that we, we, we can use it. But yes, with respect to the interoperability of force management system, light chip or ARC GIS online, not an issue. Okay, all right. Larry, thank you so much. There's a whole bunch of kudos landing in the chat there for you. Um, what an astounding amount of work uh, has gone into this. Um, I'm just going to go into some final thoughts. Is my I'm getting an odd message on my screen. Can you see my slide now? I can just see your Columbia Basin Trust slide. Okay, perfect. Um, so thanks. We're going to conclude uh, this talk for now. And um, in doing so, of course, we want to say thank you again to all of our sponsors. A reminder to everybody that a recording of this talk will be available on both the KCP and CMI event web pages. And a little plug for next week's talk coming up with Tracy Lee. So next week, we'll be welcoming Tracy Lee, who is going to speak about roads, roads, more roads, the plights of animal movement in the Anthropocene. Um, Tracy, you don't worry, it won't be too depressing. She has some really fantastic case study uh, material to present um, and, and is a fantastic speaker. Um, just a reminder uh, at this point moving forward in the series that it would be wise to double check that you're registered for the last webinars um, in the remainder of the series. Um, we're aware that there was a bit of a, a scrolling function in the registration form that wasn't highly visible for everybody. So as we move forward, um, just double check that you're registered for the talks that you would like to attend. And um, I think that's, that's it from all of us. Thanks very much, everybody. We'll leave it live for a second so that um, Larry and Dane can check out the comments in the chat and then we'll shut it down. Thanks.